So what is the perfect cup of coffee? Uh, For me, I have a couple of brands, but usually it's like, you know, small cup and it's all about the espresso inside. No espresso first. If you want perfect cup, it's not espresso. But white porcelain with a real gold uh, on the top, a gold ring. This is the perfect cup of coffee. (laughs) You ask about my hobbies. Mm -hmm. Uh, I used to finance coffee. A few years ago, I was one of the 10 biggest financiers of U.S. made coffee. And I'm getting the best possible coffee made in the U.S. Then my hobby to find the best formula. Like a monk, every day I change the formula mm-hmm. until I nail down the perfect cup. So that's a great concept. So, hmm. first of all, do they grow coffee here in the yes. U.S. or only hosted? No. You have a, a Kona is a Hawaii. Yeah, well, Hawaii, Hawaii, they have fantastic coffee, but here on... No, well, mainland, mainland. Uh, not yet, when climate change, probably in 50 years, we're going to have in uh, the south, probably, in some high elevation <laughs> in New Mexico, possible, we'll have a coffee. But uh, right now, only in Hawaii, uh, climate not allow mm-hmm. coffee to grow on the mainland, but the best coffee come from Kona. And I'm mm-hmm. getting yeah. every season from August... Starting in August, I'm getting my uh, right portion, and I mm-hmm. my hobby is to find the perfect cup, the perfect formula. How much coffee? Yeah, how I long? Think this will be. No, I think that this is going to be a shout out to uh, Jen Byrne because we are also on the journey to find the perfect espresso. You're talking about coffee, and we can you know, argue about what's the best way mm-hmm. to make coffee out of those godly beans, yes. right? So what are you, like a French press? A drip? I always use... What's it, are, you, are you one of those pour over a hipsters? No, French press is the right tools. A, mm-hmm. Or just like all good old Turkish coffee, cook it on the oven, on the top. A, but French press is my a, day-to-day tools. And just changing the formula, how much coffee ratio for water and coffee, how long, and what other um, additive, cinnamon, cocoa, and sometimes um, oh, wow. all spices. Mm-hmm. That, that a lot of things can be added. So... Tzvi guy, are you going by Tzvi or Chuck? How, how uh, should I introduce you? You can call me Tzvi as long as you know how to say it. If you can, just call me Chuck. Okay, so I have Mr. Guy with me today. <laughs> it, it, Tzvi is an investment banker, and usually people ask, especially when we are dealing with insurance, and we saw more and more investment bankers now at ITC, what is the role of an investment banker? Why, why are you guys there? Aren't you like only on the part of the M&A? Um, it's a very common uh, question people ask, especially in the early stage and startup who don't understand why they need. And if we're looking on the insurance industry, the insurtech beyond the US, look in Israel, in Europe, in a few other spots, the regulation is not as heavy as here. People asking why we need in the seed round, around A, why we need investment banker. And the answer is very simple. Like any other business, you focus. When you start a business, you focus on your own business. You have to build a team. You develop a product. You develop a relationship. The last things you have time to do is develop a pitch, develop strategy, learn regulation, whether they are little or a lot. It takes a lot of time. And lawyers and accountants are not always there to answer for this question. The role of the investment banker is first first of all to navigate through the regulation, guide, uh, again, whether it's a seed money or round A, um, navigating through the regulation, um, paperwork, anything that uh, the government or other regulatory body in your industry may look at you. The second and not less important is be an advisor. Uh, advise how to build a business from the ground up, 
that investor will be appealed to investors. You may have a model that is great, but will not be appealed to investors. My role when I step in is look on the business, advise how to build it from the ground up, from the foundation. The foundation is everything. People always assume that the investment banker come in, look, take your pitch, your pitch deck, and running with his briefcase in the street to find money. It's the last thing the investor wants you to do is show up in the door with a briefcase. You do have globally over 200,000 institutional investors in public records, maybe there are more. You're not going to see 200,000, even if you screen only 5,000 of them, you're not going to see them. Technology changed the role of investment banker. If in the past was raising money was the main uh, task, today, beside navigation regulation, is the approach for the market and use technology, use the new uh, big data science to find the investor needed. But this is practically the last step I do. Uh, most time, if I advise correctly, and if the business apply some of this advice, a uh, build the presentation investor want to see, the money come in. The smallest part of all my work is actually go find and uh, make a presentation. The key is the foundation. Uh, to have legit business with proper mm -hmm. solution for an existing problem and have a good team who can execute it the three basic uh, rule of good business, which was always been, not only in technology, and be practical. Uh, my always last advice when we're done is be practical because this will raise money. If you are not practical, you will never raise anything. Because I never thought about an investment banker as the one who will help raising funds. And you already talked about seed and series A, because in my mind, it's always, part, you know, regulation, helping with merger, merger and acquisition, going to IPO now with all the spec craze, helping to structure that. And please talk me if I'm completely wrong about that. Now. I thought that you're going to tell me, yeah, you know, we are also looking into helping startups, but, you know, structure their Series C, Series D, as they are getting into bigger debt um, raise or, you know, something like that. And you're talking about seed and A. Isn't that a little bit too early? Why do they need you at seed? Uh, the answer is it's never too early. The earlier we okay. get into business, the better we can uh -huh. help. If we can come be in before mistake done, we look at this as a long term. To succeed in the pre-IPO timing of a business, whether it's go to a SPAC or other, if we arrive early at the pre-seed and we see a great idea that can turn to a business, it's the best time to come in. We can navigate and advise how the business will be for the long term. And if you raise the seed money correctly, you're going to raise the A and B and C and go public. If you do it wrong and you carry mistake, you will end it somewhere after second round. You're not going to be in business. That the earlier you get investment banker, the more successful you're going to be. And without naming uh, businesses, there was few IPOs, few merger with a SPAC that didn't come out right. And one of the reason is most of them have the first investment banker came in at round D. Uh, they didn't have mm -hmm. the foundation and the advice of a banker from very early stage to guide them through the process and position them in the right place when they're ready to go public. If they want to go public, not everyone uh, need to go. In some industry, maybe there's other option. But if they choose and they had the investment banker with them, even if it's they choose another banker to do the IPO. People like Goldman Sachs, uh, Morgan Stanley. But if you have a smaller firm with you, holding your hand, they will prevent you from doing mistake uh, when you go to talk to the banker to do your IPO. When you send me your bio, I was looking at that, it's like, well, 
That's a very long, <laughs> that's a very long history and experience. You've been in the industry for 30 years. You are on a, a, bo- a chair of a board in all kinds of different uh, activities. You are part of a boutique bank or I'm investment com- bank. Most likely I'm complete investment banking. Most likely I'm completely butchering <laughs> that. So can you give us a quick introduction about who you are, your background and your company? Of course. Uh, I'm an investment banker with Eastgate Security. It's a boutique investment bank focused on early stage and fast growing companies, both equity and debts raising. Uh, we act as a lead advisor uh, for smaller firm with the intent to make them bigger. Um, my background come, I, I started in business uh, in 1992 in consumer good. I was um, running my own business for a while. I was the CEO of a middle-sized consumer good company that market product for the hardware industry. In 2006, we were the largest supplier of a pet product in the hardware industry in the country. In um, 2010, I become full-time, nine, I become full-time investment banker, doing structured finance and support mainly large projects. Um, during this time, I was sitting on the board of several uh, technologies institution and education. I was on the advisory board for the Department of Education uh, on the technology committee in California. And currently, I'm sitting, I'm the chairman of the District Export Council in uh, Central California. Uh, my term come to end uh, next year in the summer. So we met a few years ago and it was a great connection and we've been chatting about all kinds of things especially in the fintech and the insurtech industry and the interesting thing about insurance is that especially for the startups uh, you have two two types of startups right you have the the service providers and you have the ones who are dealing with risk so you know that they need to be they need to have capital a lot of capital as they grow mm-hmm. if they don't have it they cannot grow that's a big that's like a red light red flag, and most likely that startup will fail and disappear over the next few years. So I can see how your role is very important to them. What, what's your take, especially as, as we've seen, you talked about different specs and going public. What's your take on, on what we see currently in the industry? Okay. If we're looking on the insurance trends overall, uh, you have a several uh, improvements that will change the insurance industry going forward. Um, one of the, more, the biggest impact is uh, artificial in, applied artificial intelligence, a big data analytic. And one portion that everyone always miss is uh, device technologies, sensors. If you read recently, one of the big insurance company invested in a sensor to installing cars it's not yet in Mm -hmm. uh, operation but sensor to put in a car to know what the car is doing or if you look in um, uh, the big changing game company hippo they are providing their customers with sensor from water floods to other damages or even break into the house we, I see that this is the area where the less people talking. People talking about artificial intelligence in other areas, but devices that help reduce risk is also in sure tech. We have a, a client, he's a former executive in Nokia. He created a product that helped um, save life of a bike and motorcycle rider. It's give them the eyes they don't have. It's a computer vision. Um, in my opinion, this is a insurance, insurance technology. Uh, how many accidents are there with motorcycle or electrical bike? Uh, the small technology like this of devices that people ignoring or not calling insurance are part of uh, insurance. They reduce in risk. Risk is the business of insurance. Um, the other side is reducing the cost through stream of operation and trusted servers to make sure you trust your information. It's not less important. And this area also, it's still in early stage, but we're going to see improvement over the next few years 
of trusted data in artificial intelligence who changing completely the way insurance company is working. Insurance is a low profit okay. business. Any small improvement will make a big change. And how do you see it from your side in terms of the, the funds that need to be structured into these deals? Because as I said, you know, so you brought a uh, hippo. There was a, I think that Truth went through an IPO. Hippo did a SPAC, a Metal Mile, Lemonade. Also, I think IPO Keen may be going for a SPAC soon, um, if memory serves me right. So we had a few exits. I would say that the bigger ones in the, in the recent uh, two years. What have you seen from your side as an investment banker in terms of the different companies and startups and their need, especially as they go out uh, to be a public company? Um, when we describe needs, we need to talk what they believe the needs or what the needs is. There are two different things. And uh, no matter how experienced is the company, I see a big gap between the needs and the needs. <laughs> Um, the biggest needs is proper structure and focus management on what's important most and leave everything else for professional accountant, lawyer, bankers. Uh, we notice that many of the early stage focus too much on the fundraising and abandoning the core business. And many of them will not get to the IPO just because of this part uh, to build a strong belt of advisor around them to take the load of the work uh, related to the non-focused business away from them. The CEO, the CFO have to focus on what the business is and how to be most efficient in what they do. Uh, issue number two, uh, you notice I didn't mention money yet. Uh, issue yeah. number two, is to understand where the value is uh, and wh what value they bringing to the insurance industry. And I notice in many places, uh, people who brought technology and don't have the background in insurance, not completely understand where the value added of the product. They understand insurance needed. They believe there will be the next big things in insurance, but they are not clearly see it from the eyes of insurance executive. And if they always ask for money, but I always tell them before you get the money, you need to understand your value in the market. And this means to be in an event, to talk to insurance executive, to go out there to conferences, uh, participate in the insurance industry life, to understand what's going through a CEO of insurance company when he wake up in the morning and knowing what he's going to see. Do you provide solution for the problem? You're facing this morning or not. And if you don't understand that, you're not going to be insurance technology startup to succeed. The, the last is money. Nobody can build a business without money. But if the first two part will be in place, the money will come. Insurance companies will invest in you. Uh, investment companies that related to technology and like the insurance. And you have to understand insurance in order to invest in insurance technology. And there are much less investor in this field than in other um, technology like healthcare. You're not gonna find as many insurance technology investors as many is in the bioscience and healthcare. Platform healthcare have thousands of investors to choose from. Insurance technology is more specific uh, item. The insurance technology are more specific for smaller group of investors that understand it and understand the future and the life cycle of insurance uh, startup. Now, would you consider, which is sort of a jump to the side, right? Would you consider InsurTech as, you know, the stepbrother or the, the cousin of FinTech? Or is it a standalone by itself? My opinion is a standalone. You are not, of course, insurance is financial business, but insure technology, it's a field on its own. And it's a connection of all of the fields that people look in. Artificial intelligence will not work correctly if you don't get the trusted data. 
to collect trusted data, you need in the end some device collecting it, either from a car that's moving fast, or bicycle, motorcycle, or flooding the house. You need um, accurate sensors, devices, transmitting trusted data that get analyzed by artificial intelligence. There are many, just mm -hmm. in this three area, there are a lot of technology related items that need to be developed. There's space to many new startups to go into any of this field, or maybe platform connects them all. The, mm -hmm. the, the endless area. FinTech for itself, as we know it today, it's been much longer time. You do have all the payment system, uh, analyzing um, saving accounts. I have another client, he's a robo advisor. Um, he developed algorithm to invest money of young people, college students. In his case, the technology he developed took a few years. Uh, if you compare it to insurance tech, he had regulatory framework to work with, non-regulatory framework. He had to go through over a couple of years to be registered. In the insurance, many of this area, not yet the regulator don't know yet how to deal with. It may be a, a new area, it's take longer, it's definitely from investment banker point of view, I don't put them in the same uh, group. For me, it's a area on its own with its own rule, different players. Uh, it's not resemble a lot the, the standard, if you can call, uh, to the mm -hmm. fintech. Yeah, if we are taking London as an example, it's a difference between the city and Canary yes. Wharf. <laughs> if we are looking at New York, it will be the difference between I don't know, downtown and, well, sort of downtown. So that's not a good example. Midtown. Uh, let's go with Midtown or let's go up to um, uh, Hartford, Connecticut, mm -hmm. which has a few carriers there or just or a little bit in Chicago, a little bit here, a little bit there. It's a little bit in the US. It's, you don't really have a capital of insurance. Yeah, the past capitals or claiming to be capitals. That's a... A little bit more spread out, right? Um, what do you think about the, the spec race? How is that compare for the IPOs and the success of the startups that took that track? Uh, SPAC is a trend, as, as you've seen already, not always work well or most time. Mm -hmm. uh, the merger not always work well. It's very difficult to make Spark merger for the number if, uh, behind to work. Uh, the value added after the Spark merger have to be to justify it in order to do it. It's appear without having inside knowledge that many of these Spark being for, forced number to justify it. And you can see by price of stock after merger falling from $15 to $5. And there is a reason mm -hmm. for it. Uh, the SPAC merger not always uh, justified. And we've seen SPAC before, it's not new. SPAC, it's a new trend, but it's not new. Uh, the blank check company uh, traditionally used to be, years ago in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, a person with extreme knowledge in specific field will raise money in order to invest it in what he know. Investor gave him the money. He uses knowledge to execute extraordinary acquisition. Today, we see people that made money without, um, I would not say they have an, any specific knowledge, just because the celebrities, financial celebrities, they people invest with them. Uh, the truth. Or tech celebrities. I call them a financial celebrities. There was before. They make the money of tech, they forgot what tech is, most of them. Um, and the, anyone with a big name that the celebrity will do SPAC. Soon we'll see Kim Kardashian SPAC probably, <laughs> or any other celebrities. But it's... I think that um, uh, um, uh, Trump has a SPAC now. He had, yes. And um, there's yeah, a basketball so. player uh, announced he has a SPAC now. Uh, I can't yeah. remember his name. But there is a, every celebrity, everyone that they have a known name creating SPAC. Well, this is not what Sparks mm -hmm. intended originally when they created. And I think we, this is why we see so many uh, misfit between Spark 
to company who not really good uh, fit to go public as a spy. The, the key. So this tool is yeah. So this tool has been around for twenty. I will say for long. I don't know. More. Probably before I've been around, but even yes, but right. So the question is, what's the pitfalls and why? Why is it a trend now? Oh, why is it a trend now? And what are the pitfalls that you know people who are listening to this podcast and uh, you know they may need to go that route in two three years? What should they avoid? First, avoid the merger with the SPAC unless you personally convince and someone can show you that the number work. And the the basic foundation of SPAC merger is that your participation, your merger, bring an extreme value uh, to the deal. And if you are just another startup, uh, and again, insurance, which is a lower profit business compared to other uh, technologies, uh, from the beginning may not be the best fit. Well, maybe in some cases it is, but if you ask me, does insurance a technology will be a good fit, I will be very hesitant to say yes before someone convinced me with the number uh, that it's right. Now, it's obvious that some banker make a lot of money of it, but does the investor of the SPAC make money or the investor of the startup? People who join in on round A, B, C, D, are they going to make benefits from the merger? And this is where we need to look. Does both sides have the same benefits? If the answer is yes, this is a good SPAC merger. But I rarely see mer- a, a SPAC mergers that I answered yes for both. And if you notice some other uh, financial celebrities backing off from the style of investment and the regulator take notice of it. If you raise money as a SPAC, you are a SPAC. You are not a fund. Uh, and if it's easy, it sounds because the trend, people investing in SPAC to raise money, it's the wrong reason why to do it. And there's not enough deal around to satisfy all these SPACs. My opinion, we're not going to see these trends go for many years. And if we do, the regulator will take notice and look much closer into these deals. Like they used to do. SPAC was very difficult in the early 2000, before the financial crisis, was very difficult. And you did it in England, where in, uh, in the EU later, but very not often in the US. It's become a trend just because everyone does it, not because it makes sense. Well, it's a question between, you know, it's another way to raise capital. And as we know, especially within the insurance space, you need the capital to grow. So seven years, you want to be in 50 states as an MGA or as a carrier. And if you are a carrier, you need that money to see there just for solvency and for all the other actuarial reasons, right? Mm-hmm. You need that money. So you cannot grow if you don't have the money. So you need to raise yeah. tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. And if that's an easier route, maybe that's a reason. Maybe that's a trend. However, you know, you're the investment banker. You know better than I do. Is the key what you do in insurance technology? If you are a technology provider. No, no, no. Not the technology. The insurance company, right? If we'll take Hippo, would that they are themselves. Hippo is an MGA. Uh, but let's take uh, uh, next. No, next are still uh, in a private mode. If, any, uh, with, even without the, naming them, yeah. uh, if you are true sure. insurer, uh, you first need customers. Build your market from the mm-hmm. ground up. Appeal to specific segment. Prove your concept. Don't build it on idea that you cannot prove. And you need to go side by side. Raise money and grow. If raising money is your main objective and you don't have time to build your market, which you see it uh, quite often, uh, if the CEO, the CFO, uh, the chief strategy officer, all what they do is focusing on raising money, you not likely will get to the IPO. If you raise money, and there are a lot of private money right now, it's a uh, private placement uh, to do round A, round B, you get to round D and you are sufficient, if you generate enough revenue, maybe it can, uh, sell debts. Uh, as a step before mm-hmm. going public, uh, sell debts. And if you can repay it, uh, maybe delay the IPO until your market is big enough. 
Um, yes. No, I think it's more about the, the ability, especially if you are the insurance company, right? I'm not talking about the technology companies. Most of the technology companies that operate in the insurance space, they follow the KPIs and the growth pattern that we see to any SaaS company, if they are selling direct to consumers or if they are selling to, to enterprise, mm -hmm. right? So it's very straightforward. They have that KPI and that growth and that type of path and trajectory. When we are dealing with an actual insurance company, a new startup that acts and carries the risk, if they are an MG, many carrier, not an MGA, they need that capital. So they will start with Arizona, Texas, really depends on the type of a product. They will operate in one state, grow slowly to a few other states. But every state with their regulation and their need of uh, capital at hand for, you know, for, play, uh, for paying claims, etc., they need that capital in order to grow. Otherwise, they cannot grow anymore, right? They can do their thing in one state, prove the concept. Now they want to increase and enter a new market. Um, well, one so, one yeah. advice for these companies is if they're really built from the ground up, under new concept, using new technologies to run insurance company, not like in the past. United States is not the only market. Africa is all open. Uh, Africa is the future. So let's talk about Africa. Mm -hmm. Africa is... Let's talk about Africa. What's going on there? Uh, Africa growing fast. East Africa slightly better. You have Nigeria in the West that is big. You have millions of millions of customers who may not have insurance. Uh, provide a product, use a platform, you can reach them, and you grow with much less capital needed. The capital requirement in some of the uh, African countries is lower than in Europe or US uh, states. And maybe as a beginning, we, you're going to attract investors who one Africa. Actually, yesterday I had a conversation with a new uh, startup in Europe who started to raise money and the investor in the first meeting told him, shift your effort to Africa. It's easier. We're going to put more money if you go start in Africa, have a few million customers. Only then we're going to come to US. We're going to have maybe not the same profit, not the same revenue, but you're going to have million user of your product uh, because they have no other product right now. And in many segments, in some, there are already competition. People are not going to sleep. They see what's happening. Uh, in some products, there is no uh, solution. In some, there are many. But it's um, whatever insurance section you are, I, I will recommend look in Africa as a solution to start your business and build clientele. You will find it easier in many areas. There of course, more difficulties in other. But uh, everything has solutions. Africa is still Africa and it has its own, of course, um, challenges there, but the potential is huge. It's huge right? and it's changing for good. In many areas, it's changing for good. Uh, if you look on Rwanda, what's yeah. happened the last few years, it's a wonderful place for tourists, for investments, for the coffee. Uh, you have Kenya, uh, <laughs> that is a great, Uganda. And again, don't forget how big Nigeria is. Uh, Nigeria, Nigeria is a very large country. In, ter mm -hmm. in terms of population, it's actually bigger than the US. Mm -hmm. People don't realize it. In all financial markets, for if, uh, financial services, Nigeria is uh, moving very fast forward. Um, if you can, if you are in a financial services uh, of any kind, startup, you want to look at Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda. People say, okay, we should look at microinsurance because of the culture, because of the risk, because of what the, the different population can actually afford. There is always how you need to look into the payments. It needs to be cellular. And I'm not talking about smartphones, hardcore cellular from Nokia to whatever that may be, because there are amazing leapfrogs that are going over there that adopting advanced technologies that here are a little bit behind because the cost of infrastructure if you look to the overall uh, that what people call the attractive market of uh, africa you're going to see that the auto insurance car insurance uh, all the car vehicle insurance uh, mobility insurance and home insurance are the first to walk in but look on the business section of the insurance uh, farming uh, this is way behind. 
uh, if you talk about micro, I call it a microeconomy product, uh, everything is needed. And based on what you are, what you develop, you may find enough crowd to build your business. There are a lot of support from in large uh, institution, financial institution to develop insurance in Africa. Uh, at Eastgate, we develop relationship with several of these institutions that if someone wanna develop his product in Africa, uh, he will get support that he's not gonna see anywhere else. And I will give you just a small, um, a small tool mapping your reinsurance, your risk uh, selling me uh, mechanism. If you start insurance company in the US, you need to do it on your own with your own investment. If you do it in Africa, you will get it. I, I don't like to use the word free, but you're going to have all these tools available for you from large institutions that are happy to help you because they want you to get the product out there. Uh, then right now in Africa, there is assistance from all the way from ATI to Africa Development Bank for other institutions who are eager to help you build your insurance in Africa. Now, I don't want to open a, a new topic of, okay, great, mm -hmm. I would like to start a business in Africa. How should I do that? Especially, I'm sitting here, actually, both of us sitting in a sunny California in the Golden State. How do we do that? But we leave that to a different episode or no, you, a different article in post. You just answered the opening question. What investment banker can do for you? You okay, just answer so it. And a better banker can do for you. Go. <laughs> he can direct you to where you should start your business. Yeah. And the different opportunities that usually you are not aware of. Exactly. It's like, you know, and we, we start. Mm -hmm. Opportunities is in all segments of InsurTech, from devices to technology to actual insurance companies. There are opportunities around the world that if you are within your own community, whether you're in Tel Aviv, or in uh, Silicon Valley, or in Hartford, Connecticut, you don't know because you're not exposed to them. Uh, the localization of opportunities, it's where investment bankers come to play. I will add also the clinical thought about funnel and process. It's something that also Dustin Yoder, uh, that was a, on a previous episode, is the CEO of uh, Surefy. He talked about that his approach is about funding. And when it comes to raising money, and again, we're jumping into funds, mm -hmm. although business development, apparently it's also a big value proposition by the investment banker, is that you need to approach everything like a funnel, very clinical attitude, right? There are 2,000 investors in this. Then you, you go through the funnel step by step until you finally get the 10 investors that each one can write a check of 2 million or whatever you actually need to accomplish your goal. Because at the end of the day, capital is a tool. It's not the goal. It's not the end. Exactly. It's a tool to make the business, right? And I will tie that into, the, into Africa and insurance. Insurance is... A, an economic uh, safety net. Mm -hmm. It's an st economic stabilizer. If you don't have that risk hedging tool within your country, within the norm, within the culture, you, mm -hmm. the, the downside and the trust, which is a huge problem, doesn't exist. You, you, you need to build it up. Mm -hmm. And you, you cover it with this uh, statement, correct? practically the whole profile of the insurance uh, startup grows. Um, it's technology, it's trust, and the ability to mobilize economy. Without insurance, economy don't grow. Uh, whether you are a farmer who need crop insurance, if you don't have crop insurance, you cannot borrow money. You cannot borrow money, you cannot grow more. And again, go back to Africa. Africa has a, a huge empty space in the economy. With the proper insurance, Africa will grow. Uh, in US, you have a lot of competition from insurance. In Europe, you have a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. uh, what you can do in the US is improve the process. Like we said, insurances are not the most profitable businesses. Uh, improve them, uh, they make more money, insurance become more accessible to the public, make a cheaper economy will grow. But again, Africa have a huge empty space that you can jump in. In the US, you have to fight your way through. Yeah, and that's before we even touched you know, LATAM, India, um, 
if we, we can all jump on the entire BRIC, if BRIC is still a thing. I have no idea what's going on in Russia in terms of insurance, come to think about it. Uh, Ru Russia this, is a much the... more difficult space for insurance, uh, but it's still possible where you need to check with different uh, regulator what you allowed. Uh, it will take a, a company who believe Russia is its target market should engage in advance with the investment banker to navigate the regulation. Now, one point I want to make, we are uh, almost to the mm -hmm. end of the podcast. Yep, I was about to say yeah, that. Um, but yeah, please. One of the most important reasons to engage with investment banker early is the long-term view. Investment banker is not to raise your next uh, round. He's there to stay with you, raise the money, make sure you are on track, work and be part of your team all the way before the pre-IPO where you're going to choose probably a new banker with a big brand name to do your IPO. But all these years, whether it's a one, two or 10 years, you need the investment banker on your side to do what you shouldn't do. Coordinate the efforts that you don't and make sure you're successful in a, your business because he mm -hmm. provide you the tools, whether it's a money, knowledge, in direction uh, to be successful startup all the way to a large operating business. And you're going to see some of these very large companies, mainly in the insurance companies, who maintain the investment banker from the day there was a two-man operation in a Amsterdam in an apartment. You're going to see these companies that maintain their, the brain behind all the way through. Right. So if you are joining an, an accelerator or, or you're an accelerator or organizer, think beside, you know, bringing the legal team that will, or the marketing that will give some sort of a lecture about marketing legal, bring an invest, a bank, investment banker, because that's part of, of the scene. And that's what you need to, to have the right foundation for the startups that will be in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Now, we reached the, oh, we passed the 40 minutes mark already, and we are almost at the, the 45. So I'll ask you the last question that I'm mm -hmm. asking everyone who is coming on the podcast, and that will be, please give us a recommendation that you picked up in the past, uh, almost two years, COVID started. So in the past 18 or 20 months, it can be a life hack, TV show, a book, anything that, you know, from, I don't know, building a, a home studio. One, I will give you one very important advice to any startup. Be practical. No business success in the past succeed or will without being practical. And it sounds simple, but it's the most important. Practicality always mm -hmm. win. You can swim against the stream up the river, but still be practical. If you're not practical, you're not going to go anywhere. Fantastic. Zvi, uh, thank you very, very much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure having okay, you. Okay, thank you. I'm looking forward for our next one. <laughs>